All right. You guys can hear me, though. Yes. If you didn't just lose your hearing. Okay. Anyone want to guess where we're at tonight? John Seven. Seven, yes. Nice, guys. If you guys would be turning there, I would race you, but I kind of cheated. First Samuel 7. Man. Yeah, nice, buddy. I'll know by, like, eyes that you guys have made it there. I'm also trying to get this to, like, a stable point. Okay. This just falls down. We'll ad-lib the entire sermon. Is that a deal? Okay. I've got yeses to that. All right. You guys can hear me? Yeah. And we're in 1 Samuel 7? Yes, sir. Yes. All right, I need to see some eyes so that I know I can go forward. Trey, what color are your eyes, man? Blue. I'll look for them, okay? Incredible. I've got a game of peekaboo in the back. Okay. Guys, I'm so grateful for you. Uh, yeah, it's really cool to get to see you guys worship. Let's read through 1 Samuel 7. We'll pray, and then we'll, we'll talk about it. 1 Samuel 7. And the men of kiriath Jerim came and took up the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill. And they consecrated his son Eleazar to have charge of the ark of the Lord. From the day that the ark was lodged at kiriath Jerim, a long time passed, some twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you, and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and they served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. Now when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the, uh, of the Philistines. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel. And the Lord answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion. And they were defeated before Israel. And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as Beth Car, or as below Beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen, and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, Till now the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the day of Samuel. The cities that the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron to Gath. And Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines. There was peace also between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went on a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah. And he judged Israel in all these places. Then he would return to Ramah, for his home was there. And there also he judged Israel. And he built there an altar to the Lord. Let's pray, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, you're a gracious God. You're a God who's given us your word. You're a God who's given us stories to learn from, stories like 1 Samuel 7. Lord, you're a God who's working in our hearts, who's calling us to you. And Lord, we just ask that you would help us now to come, to, to receive what you have for us, to hear your word. Lord, ultimately to find your son in it and to rest in him. But Lord, not just to, to find him, but to be changed by him. So Lord, would you just show us how wonderful you are. Would you give us a heart for something bigger and better than anything we've loved before? Would you give us a heart for you? Lord, we love you. We need you. Please help me as I try and bring the word to these guys. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. I want to start by painting a picture with you guys. You guys ever painted? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Do you like painting? 
Okay, all right. Oh, there's a mixture. My wife, she's a... Hey, guys, do I got you? I'm looking for back row here. Focus on me, okay? Thank you. Guys, my wife is a full-time artist. And when we first met, we met in an art class. I considered myself an artist. And then I went on a couple of dates with her, and she did art next to me. And I no longer call myself an artist. <laughs> so, uh, man. Anyways, there's more that could be said there. Ask me about it sometime. But in our picture, guys, what we're going to do is we're going to paint a picture of a person. Okay? This person is sitting down. And what are they holding in their hands? Not the Bible. That's a good guess. Not a book. Although I can see why you'd think that. It's a cereal bowl. Mm. What do we suppose is in the cereal bowl? There's milk, that's true. But as we get closer and we start painting, Wesley's taken over and he does something really disturbing. He puts pickles in the milk. Is that weird? <laughs> does Wesley need to get on? Okay. Sorry, Wesley. And then Connor comes and he's contributing to the painting we're making together. And Connor puts bits of bread in, in there. That's, that's kind of weird, right? Um, okay, now Nolan comes by, and he puts uncracked and uncooked eggs in that cereal bowl. Okay? So this is the painting we have. We're going to call the person who is holding this, his name's Jim. Everyone with me? Okay. Jim is holding this cereal bowl. Now we're going to paint the next person. They are receiving the cereal bowl from Jim. What expression are we going to put on this person's face? That one, exactly that one. Horror, anger, disgust, okay. Fair enough. I'm certainly not eating that. Uh, maybe you guys have a different story there. Okay, we would rightly expect, I'm going to call this person Lisa. Lisa, to receive this cereal bowl with disgust, if she received it. Now let's get a little more context. What if, instead of it just being Jim and Lisa, we found out, the way we had painted Jim was he was a toddler, okay? And Lisa, we painted Lisa as his mom. Might the expression be different? I think so. If a little kid, <laughs> no, Josh is going to show some tough love to his kids. Guys, this is trash. You've got to throw this out right now. Okay. Guys, I think rightly we might expect that the illustration would look different. Is that true? Okay. I'm going to give one more, one more picture here. Little kids like to help their parents clean the house. Is that true? No. I'm talking real little kids. Yes, I'm talking little kids. I don't consider anyone in this age range to be a little kid. Little kids. Okay. Do they like to help clean the dishes? Are they good at it? No. No. But they like to help. Hey, guys. I need you, okay? Do I got you? All right. Little kids like to help vacuum. Is that true? You guys seen those Fisher-Price vacuums with the balls in them? Yeah? Okay. If mom starts to vacuum, which mom vacuums, if mom starts to vacuum and the little kid pulls out his Fisher-Price vacuum, is mom like, little Timmy, you're so dumb. What are you doing? No, yeah, that would be very unkind. No, she's complimented, isn't she? Isn't she? I'd be touched. I'd, you're emulating me. That's really sweet, and you want to help. That's amazing. She's appreciative of that. But how do you suppose it would go over if my wife asked me to vacuum, and I pulled out a little Fisher-Price pop-up <laughs> vacuum and started going around the house? Is she going to be touched? No. Complimented? <laughs> appreciative? Yes. Probably not. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan? It would be very weird. I would be concerned for myself. She'd be like, then you need to talk to someone, and I would probably tell her she's right. Um, anyways, the point I'm trying to make here is this, that when we start trying to love someone, and we all have to start if we're going to start, trying to love someone and loving them are at first the same thing. Likewise, trying to submit to God and honor Him, and actually submitting to God and honoring Him, are at the start the same thing. This is important because of our story today. You'll remember previously in the book of 1 Samuel, Israel attempted to use the Lord for their own selfish devices. Do you guys remember this? Yeah. 
Yeah, they took the ark of the Lord into battle so that they could win. They were essentially treating him like a totem for their own, like a good luck charm, you could imagine. That plan failed, and they were violently slaughtered by the Philistines. Likewise, the Philistines attempted to set up the ark of the Lord as a trophy, as if they'd captured God. You guys remember that? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay, that's great. Yeah, that's true, man. So they acted as if they owned God, and they were crushed by the Lord as well. Then the Philistines repent very poorly, but I think they take a real shot at it. They realize they cannot keep in rebellion against God because of the reasons Jaden just mentioned. Right? They can no longer keep his throne hostage. The Lord is destroying them. So they don't get most of the details right, but they make a genuine attempt at asking God for pardon. They take a real swing at submitting to him, at honoring him, at loving him. And he honors it. He receives it. He accepts their repentance. In our story today, we find that Israel is ready to do a similar thing. They're not good at loving God. They're not practiced at it. As we find at the beginning of the story, they have a whole bunch of other gods that they're presently serving. But they're about to take a real swing. They are attempting to submit to him. They are trying to love him. They put away those false gods. They choose to serve the Lord only. They fast and they confess in this chapter. They repent. None of it is perfect. Some of it is even for the wrong reason. And yet the Lord honors it. How many of you guys have bought your dad a gift for Father's Day? If you haven't, I'm going to recommend that you do that at some point. I think that that's a worthy adventure. What kind of gifts have you guys gotten your dad? Yeah, Piper. I have Oh, that's fun. Okay, that's a good gift. Yeah, Malachi. You guys are good. Okay. If I have kids, I'm going to like get them in touch with you guys. Yeah. Kaylee, go ahead. Yep. Okay, nice. Nice. We like to joke. I'm talking about Carolyn's side of the family here, but we like to joke on the bender end of the family. And for Father's Day, I believe, one year, they got their dad uh, a mug that said, world's okayest dad. Uh, anyone have any? Uh, you guys are good at getting gifts. I'll tell you. I was anticipating uh, more along the lines of gifts that I would have gotten my dad growing up. I remember one year I got him a baseball character. I don't even know who it was or what team it was. Sorry, Taylor. <laughs> Sorry, Taylor. <laughs> um, my dad doesn't like baseball. I just didn't know what to get him. I was like, here you go. Uh, so some years I got him socks, uh, which actually is a good gift. I'm going to stand by that one, but not for your dad on Father's Day. Uh, okay. Good dads, though, sometimes get bad gifts. Are you guys familiar with this concept? Yes. Are you guys familiar with the notion that sometimes dads are hard to buy gifts for? Yes. Yeah? Okay. All right, cool. All right, you guys are still in my realm. You're with me. Even though you guys have somehow surpassed this plane of existence, you can relate with me. Is it true that we often use our dad's money to get the gifts? Yes. Is that true? Okay, okay. I'm back with you. Okay. So, guys, is it fair to say... Even those really great gifts are imperfect gifts. Yep. Okay, thanks, Jackson. That's amazing. And yet, a good father, what does he do when he gets them? He receives them with joy. Yeah, dude, that is verbatim what I wrote down. A good father receives them with joy. We find the fullness of this reality in God's reception of our worship, don't we? Is our worship super broken? Yeah, absolutely. Our worship looks a whole lot more like my socks than Malachi's RC car. Uh, and he also does the work in our heart. In a very real sense, he's giving us the money to bring the present back to him. He provides the resources. We bring forward our broken love, and he receives it like a good father with delight. And this is what we're seeing in this chapter. All right, I, I want to take a second and contrast this with a reality. We'll, we'll hit on this more as we go, but... All right, if you know a man, anyone know someone who's been married for a long time? Yeah? Okay, I think that's true. You guys know Richard? No. Richard's been no. married for a good amount of time. No. You should get to know Richard. Okay, guys, you can ask that person, I'm thinking of, of guys here, what was your relationship with your wife like when you were first married? Most men will tell you it was sweet and joyous, and wonderful. There's a, a phase called the honeymoon phase. Are you guys aware of this? 
Yeah? Okay. All right, at least that's my assessment of it. But if you were to ask them, if you behaved the way you first behaved when you got married today, would it be sweet and joyous and wonderful? And I think that most of them would say no. I think, uh, I kind of hope that most of them would say no. And the reason behind this is not because we're perfect or we've arrived. Richard, have you arrived? Okay. Praise God, Richard. I love you, man. Uh, But the reality is, guys, is that at the start, our poor attempts at loving our wives are as good as the real thing. However, as you grow to know your spouse, or in your guys' case, you might have girlfriends, and find out that they like donuts, but they don't like pecans, it's no longer loving to bring them pecans. You guys get what I mean? Yeah? All right, you guys have seen people your age date, right? What? Have you guys seen people, I'm talking high school age, sorry, man. Uh, (laughs) Sorry, buddy. (laughs) Uh, Have you guys seen 16-year-olds date? There are some really cute couples, but have you guys seen some really cringy things? Yeah! Oh, okay, all right. Okay, all right, cool. Guys, if you do really cringy things when you're 30, n- neither party in the couple appreciates it anymore. It's, uh, anyways. Guys, love is a pursuit, and the start of that pursuit can be messy. God honors a messy pursuit. So maybe as you look around on Sundays or Wednesdays as your church, you find yourself thinking, what a messy group of people. Have you guys ever thought that? <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> I've thought that. Maybe you guys have looked at me and you're like, that dude is messy. He's got ravioli on his shirt. Uh, I don't eat ravioli very much, so I know you're not talking about me. But guys, there are some Sundays when I walk into a room and I just want to turn back around, whether that's because I feel messy or because I look at the room and I'm like, this is a messy room. And yet, what keeps me there is a realization that I've got the same issues that we all have, at least in my heart. What keeps me there is that Christ has died for both of us. What keeps us together is that God knew we were messy, and yet he died for us anyways. So we are called to try and love these people around us because Christ loves them. No matter how messy their love or our love is. Maybe you guys feel that way about your family? Anyone ever feel like there's messiness in their family? Yeah? Wow, guys. I know that there's messiness in every family, okay? And maybe you don't know where to start. Uh, Perhaps your siblings seem like aliens. He only wants to talk about video games. Uh, What does she only want to talk about? Clothes. Clothes, thanks. That's amazing, guys. That's the one. Man, I'm going to have to call you guys up before I do sermon illustrations. That was great. Uh, Mom is too busy. Dad is only thinking about work. I got you guys? Yeah? Cool. All right. No one else seems to care about God. Family members can be hard people to love. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, I think that's true. And it can be difficult, even if you do want to love them, to know how. Is that true? Hence the Father's Day baseball figurine, right? I don't know what to get you. Well, my encouragement to you is this. If God will receive our first attempts at loving Him... He will be pleased with our first efforts at loving our families as well. So we can bring our brokenness and our our broken love to the Lord, and then we can bring that same broken love to our neighbors, our families, our classmates, and our coworkers. So guys, are you guys seeing what I'm saying here? Are you pulling with me? The Israelites, very broken people. They offer very broken repentance, very broken sacrifices. In the next chapter, we're going to find that they want a king, a king not like the king that God would have them have, but a king like the rest of the world has. There's a legitimate reason, I think, as we look through this passage to say, is this this a hard and fast love or not? It's a very messy love, whatever it is. Okay, so this raises the question, though. Does this mean that genuinely religious people will be saved? Anyone want to translate what that means? Did I speak English? Do you guys understand what I mean? Have you guys ever asked, can Mormons be saved? Is that a good question worth asking? (laughs) No. Okay. (laughs) I think it's a good question worth asking. What about Jews? What about morally upright people who don't want anything to do with God? Have you guys ever asked that question? Am I I prompting it for the first time? Okay, good. All right. Do they have heaven in them? 
So answer to this question, I want to turn to a conversation between two brilliant guys who I think are actually wrong. You guys heard the name Ben Shapiro? He's brilliant. I don't, I don't have anything as a guy. I think he's wrong on this one. Have you guys heard of the name Bishop Robert Barron? No. Okay, also brilliant, I think wrong. This is what they said. They sat down to have a discussion with each other, and Ben Shapiro asked the question, what's the Catholic view on who gets to heaven and who doesn't? He went on to say, I feel like I live a good life, a pretty religiously based life, in which I try to keep not just the Ten Commandments, but a solid 603 other commandments as well. And I spend an awful lot of my time promulgating what I consider to be Judeo-Christian values, particularly in Western society. So what's the Catholic view on me? Am I basically screwed here? This is what Robert Barron answered with. He said, no, the Catholic view, go back to the Second Vatican Council, which says it very clearly. I mean, Christ is the privileged route to salvation. He says, God so loved the world, he gave his only son so that we might have eternal life. However, the Vatican II clearly teaches that someone outside the explicit Christian faith can be saved. It may be received according to your conscience, if you're following your conscience sincerely. Or in your case, if you're following the commandments of the law sincerely, you can be saved. So did you hear what the conversation was? Do you guys understand what exchange just happened? What's Ben Shapiro's question? Yeah, Connor. Can he be saved? Yeah, can he be saved? He, he dedicates his life to trying to keep the law. He's a sincere Jew. He's, he's really working at it. And what's Robert Barron, Bishop Barron, what is Bishop Robert Barron's answer? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. If you keep the law well enough and you're doing it sincerely, you can be saved Is that in conflict with the Christian faith? I want to tell you yes. Jesus says this of of people who are extraordinary at at performing what I would call religious tasks or moral tasks. In Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So how do we hold this reality in tension with the reality of our text today, which says that God receives very broken, sloppy first attempts at worship? I want to paraphrase Tim Keller for a second. He says that religion, ritualism, or moralism, ritualism, and sensationalism, do you guys know what those are? What is moralism? If I'm a moral person, what am I? Do we know? A good person, yeah. So that's what Ben Shapiro is appealing to. Hey, if I'm a good enough person, can I get to heaven? What is ritualism? What's a ritual? Jackson, what's a ritual? Um, something that you do to accomplish something. Okay, yeah. No, that's good. You're making progress. A ritual is something you, you keep methodically. It's like a tradition. You guys with me? Okay. There are plenty of people who rely on their ritualism. We belong to a historic form of pattern of doing things. We belong to a historic church. We belong to this, that, and the other. And sensationalism. I've had this experience. You guys have heard this before? Yeah? I rolled on the ground for 20 minutes. Wesley only got five. I'm more righteous than Wesley. Sorry, dude, you're just right there. It's too easy. I apologize. Wesley does not put pickles in his milk. Everyone be advised. Guys, yeah, thank you, Wesley. So to paraphrase Tim Keller, moralism, being a good person, keeping rituals, and having experiences, sensual experiences, are terrible substitutes for Christ. Do you understand what I mean? Yes? Okay. Therefore, when we read this passage and we see the Israelites or the Philistines offering up moments of worship and then disowning God, when we see them go to and fro, this is the cycle of the judges, right? They, they wander away from God. They fall into the hands of an enemy. They pray to the Lord to help them. They turn back, and then the cycle repeats. I think it's reasonable to ask, what kind of love is this? Is this love an infatuation, or is this true love? God wants to have us, or wants us to have him as our true love. Not just as a, if I can use the word, momentary crush. You guys get the difference? English, we only have one word for love. You guys know that? 
It's love. So I love hot dog and I love my wife. Are those the same things? Am I, am I like on the remotely the same page? No, of course I'm not. Guys, I, I want us to reflect on this and just ask the question, do we love getting the rules right? Do you love feeling like you belong to something historic or pretending to be spiritual and, and righteous and you've just got a generally fond feeling of God? Or is he the true love? Is he the thing that you want more than all of the stuff around him? So this brings me to my second point. Anyone want, remember what the first point was? Okay, amazing. <laughs> Trying to love someone and loving someone are at the start the same thing. We have a messy love that God will honor. The second point is the reason behind that. The reason that our attempts at love, despite being broken and faulty, are enough is actually because we're not the heroes of the story. God is. He's the one who defeats the Philistines both times they're defeated. Is that true? It's true. I've titled the sermon, The Hero Rises. I feel like that's a, it feels like a Star Wars movie title, and I, I'm going to own that. But as I studied the story, I couldn't help but think of some of the most iconic characters in stories who were known for their power. Darth Sidious, yes? Yeah, he's powerful. Or I think of emperors in gladiator coliseums or kings in jousting. In these stories, the characters are often left sitting. Is that true? Can anyone think of a moment, really, where Darth Sidious is standing? I can think of like very, very few moments. Okay. I'm just looking for a yes, guys. Thank you. Okay. The purpose of this is so that when they rise, when they stand up, all of our spines tingle. The hairs on the back of our neck stand. The room goes quiet. God is the hero of this story. He is the one the Israelites need to rise and defend them and destroy their foes. How many of you guys have read the Percy Jackson series? Yes, yes, yes. Is that still a popular series? Okay, cool. Who is the hero of the story in the Percy Jackson series? I can't make it easier, guys. It's Percy Jackson. Yes, I, some of you said it. I did hear that. Focus in for me. Imagine if in those stories, as you're reading Percy Jackson, instead of encountering brave and faithful Percy, who would dip himself even in the river sticks to save his friends, we encounter a different Percy. A Percy who refused to get off the couch or learn how to use a sword or risk his life for the people in the world he loved. Would those books have a happy ending? No, they wouldn't. Right. No, because Percy is the hero of the story. His sacrifice and his service are necessary for the tale to have a good ending. The hero must pull through. He must be valiant. He must be strong. He must be able to vanquish the dark foes nobody else can. He must be willing to stand in the path of destruction for everyone he loves. God is the hero of the story, not us. My friends, the reason our broken love, mine and yours, is enough is because we are not the heroes of the story. The reason the Israelites' love can be messy, and yet God can receive them, is because the hero of the story is not them. All of these salvation stories, including 1 Samuel 7, our story today, point to the grand plan of salvation which God has realized for us in the person of Jesus. He is the reason that we can come before the Father and be received as sons and daughters. He has bought righteousness for us by dying in our place, by being buried in a tomb, and by rising again. He is the hero, and he is the hero by his blood. Which brings me to my third point. So all of this fits inside itself. First, our love is very messy. Our attempts at love are very messy. And that's just as good at the beginning. Second, it can be just as good because ultimately... Your relationship with the Lord does not depend on how well you perform. You are not the hero of the story. God is. And third, and I'm actually not talking about our love anymore. God loves you. In contrast to our broken love, he loves us perfectly. The amazing thing about heroes of this proportion is that they don't need any of the people that they sacrifice for. God doesn't need us. 
He isn't benefited by saving us. He wasn't benefited by saving the Philistines. He's not benefited by saving the Israelites. Why, then, does he save them? It's because he loves them. Can we see that? Can we see the grace that he shows them, the patience that he shows them, the kindness that he shows them? Now, if we stop here, we can see that God loves the Israelites and the Gentiles of those days, but someone might be thinking, it's still a leap to say that God loves us from this point in the story. Well, firstly, I think we can see it in God's character. God loves broken people in the story. But secondly, we find that God does save the Israelites because he loves them. However, he also saved them because he planned to send his son into the world through these Jews. He saved them so that he would have people that could raise his son and sacrifice him on yours and my behalf. Because I, I just want to ask, do you know this Jesus? Do you know this God? Have you received him? Yes, he died for the sins of the world, but did he die for your sins? How will we know that? Are we going to have like a fitness contest to see who's most loved by Jesus? It's not how it is, guys. <laughs> guys, the only way we know is by falling on him and trusting in him. As we've already stated the only kind of love we have is a very messy, broken one. If it's a competition to see who loves Jesus more, it's kind of like, hmm, actually, this is, a, this is actually not my illustration either. It just popped into my head. There's another Tim Keller thing. We've been reading a book. Seeing who loves God enough is like picking three of us to swim. Who, who's a good swimmer in here? Okay, we've got Jasper. Who's an okay swimmer in here? Okay, uh, let's go with Cody. Okay. All right, who's a bad swimmer in here? Anyone a bad swimmer? You guys okay with that? Yeah. Okay, let's go with you guys. Now the task is for us to swim from, we'll go South America to Spain. Okay? okay? You can pick your spot in South America. Everyone can choose wherever they want to start. Anywhere, everyone can land wherever they want to land in, in Spain. Who's our poor swimmer again? Who? You guys are our poor swimmers. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. You guys making it? No. Cody, you're an okay swimmer? Are you making it? No. Jasper, you're a great swimmer? Yes. You making it from South America to Spain? No. All right, someone keep an eye on this guy in your bodies of water. He's got, he's got bigger ambitions than he can handle. Yeah, yeah, you guys can look at the map later, okay? Guys, my point is, is that all of us have, even, even those who are really good at executing the right rules, even those of us who are in the hottest pursuits of the Lord, fall immeasurably short of what we actually need. C.S. Lewis describes it in the reverse. He says that uh, us trying to get to God is like us being in a desert and we're looking for a single well. And someone never gets anywhere close. They never go the right direction at all. And another man gets five yards in the right direction and another man dies 100 feet from it. Does it matter how close you got to the well? Not if you fell short. You still die in the desert. Guys, we need this Christ. And the good news is that he has made a way for us. I just, I hope we understand that, that, that we're not sufficient heroes for our own story. In each of our own lives where we should have found love, we found selfishness. Where we should have been able to rely on patience, we found unsteadiness. Where we ought to have been thoughtful, we were engaged in thoughtlessness or recklessness. So guys, we're, we're not the heroes that we need. And I think the Israelites have come to realize that. Do you guys see that in the story? First time the Philistines attack, what do they do? They just run out there. We got it. 4,000 dead, what do they do? Okay, we'll grab the Ark of the Lord. We'll bring it out with us. We've got this. And what happens? What happens? Yeah. Yeah. Ark gets taken. Now there's 34,000 dead. Excuse me. The Philistines think they've beaten the Lord. They put them out on the, their display amongst their gods. And what happens? They all get sick and their god breaks. Right. Yeah, their god breaks. They all get plagues. Neither of these guys are sufficient heroes for themselves. And neither are we. They turn to God in this chapter. It's a very imperfect turning to the Lord. And yet in this moment, they are saved. So friends, this story is of great comfort to us as believers. It's a great comfort to us because it is part of the greater story in which God brings us his son through these people, 
which he has kept alive. He's preserved them for this. But it's also a comfort because it's a small painting in which we find ourselves, a broken people with broken love, for a perfect, patient, merciful, and saving God who welcomes us in our brokenness and saves us in our weakness. All right. Thanks, guys, for listening. Let's pray, and we'll break off into small groups. Dear Heavenly Father, you are gracious, God. You are a God who, (laughs) Lord, all of the love we can give you is so broken, is, is so immeasurably short of the glory you're due. And yet, Lord, because you are so wonderful, you've made a way for us. You've, you've made a way to receive it. Lord, we can bring our nothing because you're everything, because you've given us everything through your Son. Would you help us to reflect on that tonight? Would you help us to point each other to that reality? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys.